about acoustic phonetics today, but before that, I thought we did do a little bit of review on what we did last time. Very quickly, last time when we talk about voice onset time, can anybody remember the definition or what's voice onset time? Uh, voicing starts um, my my minus release the air. Okay, that's what the formula says. Can you give a definition of voice onset time? It's on your textbook. The moment at which the voicing starts relative to the release of the culture. Okay, so there are two time points that we're focusing on. When you start your voicing and when the closure is released. And last time we, we learned about um, in Mandarin, we have the voiceless unaspirated and voiceless aspirated stops, right? And we also learned there is a pecu peculiar case that in some, ca in some language, their voiced stop, the voicing actually start during the closure. So can any of you do a voiced D? D, D. So you can feel like your vocal folds are already at work when you're doing the closure. Again, this is the wave form because you see the waves, okay? And this is what we call spectrogram. You need to distinguish these two terms and remember what their uh, graph looks like. And I want to point out that if, if your vocal fold is vibrating, you will see this periodic wave and, and in your waveform. And in spectrogram, you will also see a dark area, which is the, the lowest part of your spectrogram. It's called voice bar. This is just a term you need to remember. I will remind you again when we get to the hardcore acoustic um, next week. So that's the voiced stop. I'm going to teach you three new terms. So for voices unaspirated, the voice onset time is much shorter because this is where you release the stop. So last time I actually asked you guys to measure the voice onset time in your textbook, right? And in the future, we will be able to record yourself and measure the voice onset time in, on the spectrogram. And for this guy and this guy, you can actually see that the voice onset time is shorter for this unaspirated stop and much longer for the aspirated one. And for the voicing one, I'm using a different color of box because it's actually the opposite direction. And the new term I'm going to introduce you today are, oh, it's voicing lead. So we're going to call the unaspirated one, some people call them short lag. What does lag mean? Delay. delay, yes, yes. So short lag means the voicing is actually delayed, but the delay is quite short. That's short lag. lag. And the uh, aspirated one, we call them long lag, which makes sense. And this voicing lead, it means the voicing actually precedes your closure release. Okay, so these are just three new names you need to associate with the three category we learned so far. Okay, uh, just new names. Voicing lead, short lag, and long lag. Now these three categories, they are interesting because uh, languages in the world actually use different, they, they mostly use two, two out of three of these three cases. To produce a truly voiced stop, you need to have that d, mm, mm, mm. you need to have vo that voicing during the closure. So the Mandarin d and t are actually short lag and long lag. Okay, b and p are the same. And what other two pairs do we have? Have另外 一组, b p, d t. G, K are the same. They are short leg and long leg. And I was telling you last time, in English, in American English even, <laughs> the B sound that you thought were voiced, they're mostly voiceless, but they have the short leg. So they gave you that feeling that they might be voiced. Okay? So we can see that the Mandarin, the B, P, D, T, G, K, those are short and long leg the distinction. They are not voicing distinction. But unfortunately, most of the time when we're trying to transcribe them, but just now that you learn phonetics, you're not producing a truly voiced stop. 
And when we say truly voiced stop, you need to have that vibration even during the closure. It will get more clear. Now, what's, what's this country? Spain, yes. In Spanish, they use different, uh, they use different, cat they use two different, their distinction is between the voiced and short leg. So in Spanish, how do you say uh, Italian? How do you say P-A-S-T-A -A in Spanish? Pasta, pasta. It's not, if it's, how do you say it in American English or British English? You say pasta. You're actually using the long leg P to pronounce the, the, the pas, pasta. So for, for, for Spanish people, there are problems, they, they are familiar with this too, so this one become a problem. You can say ba, uh, ba or pa, they probably, it sounds the same to them. Does that make sense? Because they are familiar with the distinction between one should be voiced, so they're expecting that mm, when they hear a voice sound. Think about the consonant, think about the, the vowel, think about the tone. What's the difference between tao and tao? Aspiration. For tao, there's no aspiration, short leg. Okay? And for tao, there is aspiration, long leg. But I can bet you $10 for a Spanish speaker, they sound very similar because they cut the pie here. But you guys are equally bad because we are interested in, we, 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 we are familiar between the difference between short and long leg. So when I say d, uh, uh, dub, dub, and dub, it probably sounds the same to you, right? I actually pronounce the first one with a voiced stop, the second one with the short leg, but it sounds similar to you guys. And actually for some of you, you actually speak a language that has a three-way distinction. Thai Yu. What's the kind of official name for Thai Yu? Minnan. It's a Min dialect. It's a Min, 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 this area, and then the southern side. So it's a southern Min, southern Min. And some, some people just call it Minnan, Minnan. Can you do Tao in, in Taiwanese? Wu. Now think about your gu, feel your gu. Is it gu? Is it k? Is it g? Is it k? No, <coughs> gu. And when you're saying gu, gu, do you have that pre-voicing? Gu, 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 gu. Yes, yes, you do have that. We're gonna cover uh, the, the the phonology of Taiwanese uh, in the second half of the semester, but. In Taiwanese, you do have three-way distinction for bilabial and for velar and for alveolar. It's a slightly different story, but you, we have the distinction. So now that you realize, hey, that the reason why we study linguistics is now we get a better picture of what's going on, and it's even more interesting. Let me ask you a question: If you were born in Taiwan and then we move you to Barcelona. What do you think that, which, which language style, I mean, when you were first born, I can tell you it's a, it's a fact. You're sensitive to the distinction between this and this. They monitor the heartbeat or, or the sucking rate of their pacifier to, to see if the baby is sensitive of the, the distinction between these sounds. And the experiment shows when you're first born, you're actually, very, you're actually, you are capable of detecting and learning all this distinction. But after we moved you to Barcelona, you have no exposure of Mandarin or Taiwanese whatsoever. So, and then your perception gets biased. So the language that you can produce or, or perceive is actually very um, fundamentally affected by the environment you're exposed to. So this is what I call uh, acquired perceptual bias. You acquire this bias uh, from your environment and you have this bias. So a Spanish speaker would have a bias 
between the distinction between these two sounds and Mandarin speaker would have bias between these ones. So this gives you the reason to study Taiwanese more because then you will have a chance to be able to tell the difference of these three categories. But what we were talking about is in terms of perception, right? If you can hear the difference between the da and da. Now, we're, if we switch the angle a little bit, let's think about production. Now, this is a question for you. We have learned about voice stop, short leg and long leg. Which one? do you think would be the most difficult to acquire? For babies, we don't use the word learn because they don't actually sit down and learn, they acquire. You're just a baby and then you, you're in your cradle and then you learn language, you acquire. So what do you think is the most difficult one for, for babies to acquire? So let's compare voiced one with voiceless one. Which one do you think would be more difficult? Actually, didn't you find the voiced one very difficult? I mean the truly voiced one. You don't think the truly voiced one is difficult? The, the, the. There are so many coordination you have to do. Make sure your vocal folds vibrate when your mouth is closed. Think about when you're just a baby. That's a lot of work to pronounce a voiced stop. And then it's actually easier for you to pronounce a ba, 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 ba. When you want to do a pa, you actually have to intentionally aspirate that puff of air. Uh, the voiced one, because you have to do the voicing during the closure. So that, that's what makes it difficult. Actually, I found it, it might be interesting for you to actually read the actual paper. You probably haven't read any phonetic paper before, right? This is one of the paper that I sent you. I thought we can go over it together. It, it, it's talking about the short leg VOT stops require minimum um, temporal precision. But when you're, want to, when you're producing a voiced, by contrast, voicing lead in which the voicing onset occurs before the burst is difficult to produce because the re requisite uh, Aerodynamic condition for vocal fold vibration is difficult to maintain when the oral cavity is sealed off by a stop closure gesture. Because when you're doing the closure, you're, you still have to vibrate. You actually have to work hard to vibrate your vocal fold. The reason why we're interested in this is because for linguists, it's really amazing to find out what's universal and what's language specific. So in terms of which stop should be, will be acquired early, uh, earlier by, by children. It, sh it should apply to all children. It's just later on when they hear more distinction of this group, they, they, they would use it more. But when we were just baby, it's qu the, our ability is quite universal because we're all the same species with similar structure of your oral cavity, larynx, and pharynx. So that's why this is interesting. And if, if, it's, if it's not for these nerdy purposes, the, the, the reason why you guys, I would encourage you guys to learn more about phonetics and phonology is then you are actually able to comment on some of the language effect that we hear. So the reason why I point this out again is um, uh, a friend of mine was doing a language exchange with a Japanese fellow. So, the Jap so we always, what we always do is we start with bopomofu, right? So he, she was telling the guy that, oh, our u is like your sakura u. So the guy goes, oh, so my friend was doing i, u, u. And then the Japanese guy goes, i, u, i. <laughs> now you understand, when you, when you teach a Japanese uh, student how to pronounce the Mandarin u, you need to have that lip rounding, okay? So now you know the base of that. And then when people are pronouncing the Spanish trio, you can go, oh, oh it's just trio. You know, there are three places in your mouth you can actually produce the trio. You can be a phonetician, you know, you're a linguist. And then these are the two things I heard the other day. This is actually in the Denghui, in the Lantern Festival. They had a, they had a, 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 a probably a bee shop or some, some yeah, a, a father <laughs> from a church. And he was doing a pray, prayer in front of everybody with Yu Ren Shen Gu. I don't know about you, I think this is very hunda. 
<laughs> I don't understand why, but the point is, in his prayer, I, I, I didn't mean to tease the father, but this, is, this could happen to any uh, second language learner of Mandarin. So he was saying, Oh God, thank you. Okay, what's the difference between xin and xin? Uh, now you're supposed to comment it out using linguistic terms. The nasal is different. How is the nasal different? In heart, you have what nasal? What's the place of articulation for that nasal? Xin, xin. Where is your tongue? Alveolar. Xin, xin. Is alveolar, ba? Xin. Okay. Now, xin. Where is your Where is your tongue? It's a velar nasal. So let me ask you again. What's the difference between xin and xin? Their nasals are different. One has alveolar nasal and one has a velar nasal. And there's another thing that's different. The tone is different. Now, Xin has which tone? Xin. Tone one. It's a high level. Xin. And then Xin. Tone four. It's a high falling. So that's one of the things I want you to do by the end of the semester. When you hear an uh, interesting language phenomenon, you are able to comment on it, at least in terms of sounds. And I'm actually teaching you a lot of skill to do that. So make sure you catch up with the reading and our, our lecture. Now, what do you think this means? What do you think that guy was saying? You quite lying, ni baba. Now, what's the difference between lie and lying? has a nasal, right? Now, have you heard people saying lying? What's the difference between, I actually can't do it, lying and lying? When you, when you do lying as the app, you need to nasalize your vowel. I and I, 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 lying. Do you know what I'm talking about? The vowel nasalization. So in, in, in um, uh, American English, mo in most cases, if a vowel is followed by a nasal, that vowel will be nasalized. Now, just tell me how many wrong things this guy was doing. The nasal was deleted. And of course, there's no, no nasal, there's no nasalization. And why do they na delete the nasal then? In Mandarin, do you have any words that's a combination of I and N? You have this bias, baby. You're 18, 19, 20 years old. Your, your phonology, your, your knowledge about language is biased by your first language. Because in your first language, you don't have I and N. And for, for that guy who was saying this, he probably didn't learn English like you guys in the cramp starting from elementary school, and you guys have a lot of English exposure. But imagine those who did not learn English um, intensively, they, w they are controlled by their first language phonology, and it's avoiding them to pronounce certain sound combination. Now, moving on to aerodynamics. This is the thing that we didn't cover uh, last time. So, it's again, it sounds very exciting to, it, it's very exciting to me because Learning about aerodynamic of your oral cavity is like is to explore the potential of us as Homo sapien, as the species, what, what sounds we can produce. So if you look at your oral cavity, so this is kind of a nerdy way to draw your oral tract and your uh, vocal tract. So what happens is, do you see there are two colors here? It's orange and green. What's the orange part? Trachea, where your air comes out from your lung. And this is esophagus. Esophagus, shi dao. So they're actually parallel to each other. That's why it's very easy for you to choke when you talk and try to swallow something. Because the food goes down here, and if you're talking, 
it might just drop to the uh, trachea. When you're, when you're talking, your glottis is wide open. And then the food might drop in there. So you have your trachea, esophagus, and then this is your pharynx, and this is your ve uh, the velum and the uvula, and this is your mouth, and this is your nose. So this is just a, a, a very mathy way to look at your oral cavity, your, uh, your entire uh, vocal tract, uh, this, this parts that you use to pronounce sounds. And because we talk about the, how, how most of the sound we talk about so far, the air comes out from your lung, so it's, it's going through this and that and to pronounce sounds. Now, with the help of modern technology, we are actually able to see exactly what our mouth uh, is shaped. So you see, so this is, actually, <laughs> this is actually the tube of your mouth. Think about what you're using to pronounce sound. It's almost like playing a clarinet. It's a tube. You see how it, it's not exactly the same, but your mouth is like a tube. And all the vibration from your vocal folds go through this tube, which you can change shape by, by OK, let me ask you a question. When you, lip, when you do a lip rounding, what are you doing to the tube? Imagine there's a tube coming out from your trachea and then all the way to your mouth. When you are doing a lip rounding, you're doing nothing to a tube? When you're doing e and u, can you feel that you're actually ex elongating the tube when you're saying the u sound? Right? And if you play clarinet, you would know that the tube length actually affect your note. 管子的长度会影响你的音高的品质, right? So all the things we're doing, lip rounding or raise the tip of your tongue, you're changing the shape of that tube. And because of that, you're getting different sounds. And this is the image from MRI, and this, these are different images. And I'm using one of the most interesting thing that we human want to know is, why is it that we claim there is a 99 or 98 whatever percent similarity between us and great apes? We're so similar. But why is it that we talk and they don't? So the imaging actually tells us some story. Because um, to, to make the long story short, their pharynx is very, very short. So it, it's connected to their mouth. So it most, almost feel like they have only one tube when compared to human. We kind of have a tube here, and it's, it's perpendicular to the tube here. So our tube have more complexity, which they don't. And our tongues are more flexible than, than, than theirs. So it's probably easier for us to do French kiss than the chimpanzees. <laughs> So their tongue is more uh, fixed to the bottom of their mouth and their, their cavities are different. So, okay, getting, moving on to what we really need to talk about. We have talked about pulmonic sounds. Any, any sound that's produced with the air coming out of your lung is called pulmonic. And we're going to introduce two non-pulmonic sounds today. Um, in my experience, it's sometimes not easy to remember the name of, of these three uh, places. This is called pulmonic. Find out what these two make, is called. For this, which one is this? Glottic. This is glottic and this is villic. So for non-pulmonic sounds, the air doesn't come out from your lung. You don't use that air. You, you actually uh, can use the air inside your oral cavity. And for glottic sounds, you use the, the air body from the bottom of, of from your uh, larynx and above. And for the velaric, you actually use the air from the villum and in front of it. So we call them non-pulmonic sounds. Now for 
glottalic, glottalic. Um, like I said, we're actually using the air body inside your mouth. And the way to pronounce it is, it's actually very interesting to pronounce the sound. This is pronounced, uh, first of all, you hold your breath. And then try to block the air using the back of your tongue to, to block the velar area. And then pronounce akka, 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 Now, doing a, a pulmonic k, akka, 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 and akka, akka. When you're pronouncing this ejective, ejective meaning that you're blocking the air and then let it go to eject it outside, ejective sounds, you are not using the air from your lungs. So you can do it with your mouth. With That's glot glottalic, glottalic, glottalic. But using the same air body, you can actually produce a different sound that you actually suck the air in. This is done by you lower the you lower your larynx and then try to suck the air in. You do So you have you you can you you hold a a tiny chunk of air inside your mouth and try to suck the air in. Can you hear that it's different from the regular ba, 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 and ba, ba, ba. So when you're doing the ba and, and, and the ka, 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 you're not using the air from your lung. That's why we call them non-pulmonic. And it's capable for, for, for human beings to do that. And in some languages, they use this type of sound. In their, in their language. I did too much animation. Ejectives are actually quite common in uh, uh, native languages in North America. So if you go study the uh, study linguistic in Canada, you will have a chance to, to learn uh, languages that, we, that has this sound. And this is implosive. And it, we can read about uh, how they're pronounced later. It's on page 136. But now I want to move on to velaric. So for the velaric sounds, the way I remember them is pulmonic, the end point of pulmonic sounds are your lung, pulmonic. But for a uh, gl glottalic, the end point is your glottis. And for velaric, the end point is your velum. That's why they are called velaric. And this is the click that we were doing last time. So you guys have no problem doing a dental click, alveolar click. And when you're doing that, the back of your tongue is actually blocking the, at the velar area. And then you're lowering the, the tongue body. So the volume here is actually expanded, and the pressure here got decreased. If you remember this from your high school uh, physics, 体积变大的时候,压力会变小. So when the volume increase, for air, when the volume increase, by, when you lower your tongue tip, the, air here, the pressure here actually got decreased. So the air will actually come in. That's how you make the click sounds. And um, bilabial click is easy to make too. <laughs> yes, you can do that. So, so that's the two other uh, non-pulmonic non uh, airstream mechanism we're talking about today. Do this. So just remember, there are pulmonic and non-pulmonic. And among non-pulmonic, you can have a a longer air body or a shorter air body. And then for a longer air body, it's capable for the air to eventually go out or go in. Now, any of you, can you remember the, the, the sound that eventually the sound would go out? 
How about the one that would go in? And then for, for the, the, the sound that would go out is the Just practice a couple of times and you will know that you are not using the air from your lung. And then for Villaric, it's quite easy. You guys can do the click. Okay, so that's the pulmonic and non-pulmonic. And Peter spent a lot of time talking about exactly which one, which one is before which one. Like uh, you first close the villar closure and then you lower the tongue body and then what? I, you don't need to memorize the procedure of making the sounds, but you need to know about the mechanism behind them, okay? Okay, now moving on to uh, acoustic phonetics. Don't panic just yet because next week, we're actually still gonna talk about acoustic phonetics according to our syllabus. So although our class today might be a little bit short, we, 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 we have, we're, we're in good time. So acoustic phonetics is the study of sound waves made by the human vocal organs for communication. And um, it's, a it's a technical area of linguistics where uh, researchers depict and analyze sound waves using machines and computer programs. So actually when I was in grad school, one of my colleague, one of my, uh, my, my classmates actually insisted on measuring her, cow uh, her cat's meow for her uh, phonetic assignment. She insists that uh, she can hear the meaning of meow. So I actually got into linguistics because of acoustic phonetics. I found it fascinating we can actually see our voice. And you guys were doing that for Prat, so you know what I mean. And here are some background introduction for perceiving uh, human sounds. So in general, sound waves are, uh, they are a series of rapid expanding concentric sphere of alternating compression and rarefaction radiation from the source. Long, uh, to make it easier, have you ever played those sound, how do you call this, sound for, in cha? You do this and then it, it, it will produce some sounds. And the, although we cannot see air moving, but this is, this is actually what's happening because the, the, the fork is doing vibration. So when you vibrate, it's like the ripple in a pound. So you, some of the parts get compressed and, and it, it would uh, transmit the, the energy to the next particle. That's how your sound wave is transmitted. And the transmission, the, the sound wave get passed into the inner ear where there are some, first of all through the eardrum and then there are some hair inside your inner ear that will transmit the sound wave and sort of digitize it and transmit it into your brain. That's how you can hear the sounds. So most of the uh, people who has hearing problems, some of their damage could be the eardrum. They just, they, they have some, it's broken or the inner ear hair is not working to transmit the sound, or the, the neural nerve behind this whole mechanism is, is not connected. That they all have different problems. And for a sound to be able to be heard, it need, first of all, there, there must be some vibration. For a human speech, your vocal flow is vibrating, so you can hear the sound, and for any instrument, it's doing some sort of vibration. That's how it produces sound. And then if we were doing this in, in a space, you, we all heard the story if you are talking in the space. Can another person hear you? Because there's no air between you to carry on the wave. So this is the second criteria that you need for audible sound. And then the frequency and the amplitude need to be in the audible range. So we all heard about some animals can actually hear sounds that we cannot hear. Because the, the frequency range for human is actually between 20 hertz to, uh, to, to 20 K hertz. So what other animals can hear is sometimes in the lower range of the, the frequency. That's why the, 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 there are some amazing stories about animals saving their, 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 their master. 
and uh, in terms of dB, uh, in terms of intensity, there are certain intensity. This, this is the range of our uh, speech, and then for music, it could be uh, even louder or uh, higher. And for our audible, this the biggest circle is our audible range. Now, what happened is um, human hearing actually lost. We will we'll, we'll get will we'll, we'll gradually get worse after you get older. So. We, when you talk to your, your grandparents, sometimes you need to be louder. That's understandable. But the other thing is, there's a, a not, in terms of, that's in terms of uh, intensity, you need to make it louder. But in terms of pitch, what happens is, uh, when we get older, we actually are losing our sensitivity to some range of frequency. Here's a story. Uh, have you heard of mosquito tone ring? Usually in, in college, we try to make you not use your cell phone in class, right? But have you seen people text messaging just, be, just, just like this? But what happened is, um, how do you text message someone without your professor knowing you got a message or you're sending a message? Usually we turn it on vibration, right? But the professor can still hear the vibration. It's called mosquito tone, mosquito ring tone. And because of the age difference, there are certain frequency of ring tone that professor could not hear. This, is, this whole thing was actually came from, a, well, this, this whole idea of creating a sound that teenager can hear, but a, adults cannot. Actually, it was because there was a, I think a mall in either, I think America or, in, or, or, or Britain, that there are just a bunch of, there, there are a bunch of teenagers who always hang around uh, in the mall and making noise, playing cards, random things. And so, so the owner of the shop got really annoyed. He really wanted to get rid of these teenagers. So he, he actually found out that there are some sounds that's, that you guys can hear, but we don't usually the higher frequency sounds. And so he actually had someone and then record that, 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 that buzz. So, but because most adults cannot hear the sound, so it doesn't affect the owner, but all the teenagers are gone because they found it annoying. And then the teenagers decide, hey, we're gonna have a payback. We're actually downloading it as a ringtone. So whenever you get a message, you can hear it and your friends can hear it, but uh, we cannot. And the whole mechanism behind this is after you get older, the, in, the hair, remember I was talking about there are tiny hairs inside your inner ear, are, they're either dying or, or they're not working well and they don't grow back. So our sensitivity to the sounds in the higher frequency region just get very insensitive. So you guys can hear much higher uh, frequency sounds that we don't. That, that's how this whole uh, age-related hearing loss Okay, uh, I want to remind you that, um, and there's another website that I want to introduce you to so you can find your inspiration. It's called Left Out Loud Phonology. <laughs> it's probably not, I mean, we haven't learned about vowel harmony. Vowel harmony is, in some languages, if the root of, of your, your word has a front vowel or a back vowel, all the suffixes would be, the the vowel in the suffix will be affected to become a front vowel or back vowel. So they are in harmony. Let's go how far. So in left out loud phonology, there are cases like this that you can use for your presentation. Okay, just go to left out loud phonology. Most of the jokes will become more interesting after we learn phonology, but it's still a good start. Page 208. Exercise A, that's a waveform, and B, that's a spectrogram. Okay, in A, the, the, the person was saying, please pass me my book. And can you, can you label the words onto those um, waveform, the waveform? There are five words. And the key to that is, first of all, if you look at the waveform, which 
type of sounds will get a bigger amplitude? 哪一些 vowels will actually have a higher amplitude? So do you see five peaks? 你看着那个小山头 ，Do you see five mountains? And all those mountains are vowels. Okay, so so the first mountain and all the things next to it is please, and then pass me my book. Can can you see where the K starts? In book, there is a U vowel, right? That's where the last mountain is, and then there is a complete closure, which is a flat line, and then all of a sudden you have something tiny in the back. So that flat line is the closure of your K, and that the last thing is where you release your K. Later on, we're going to do a little bit of waveform reading, and we'll do spectrogram reading,、uh, and you will be able. It will be easier for you to do exercises like this. And in exercise B, you will look at the spectrogram and try to find out what are the. First of all, you can distinguish between consonants and vowels, and then later on, we'll learn about just by looking at the spectrogram, you will be able to tell which vowel it is, and then which consonant it is. Okay. So that's all for the lecture today.